I'm Peggy Farron. Welcome to the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. My guest today is Lisa Langell, and we're going to talk about the difference between classic versus artistic photography. But first, let me just tell you a little bit. If you're watching us live, we're live on Facebook at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. So it's facebook.com slash understand photography. So 4 p.m. Fridays Eastern Time. But then we take the recording and we put it on YouTube. So you can watch us on YouTube. And if you're not a YouTube watcher, if you like to listen to podcasts like I do, I love to listen to podcasts in the car, you can download our podcast, the same episode, um, from iTunes and listen in your car. So just do a search for the Understand Photography Show and you'll find us very easily. And while you're there, please like, comment, give us a review. It really, really helps us a lot. We hope we're giving a service here. We're trying to uh, follow our motto of Understand Photography uh, is we simplify the technical. So we're trying to have some teaching involved in our podcast and our show. So hopefully you're getting a lot out of it. And if you are, if you feel like you're lacking something in your photography education, remember our signature course is called the Four Weeks to Proficiency in Photography, and it is available. It's a it's an interactive class. So look on our website for start dates because we have the class about once every six weeks. Um, it's a four-week class. The first week class is shoot and manual. The second one is composition. The third one is all about lighting, including flash photography. And then the last one we call the techie stuff, but you'll be ready for it by that. Then you're going to go into metering modes and things like that. You're going to get a really solid photography education. One of the biggest problems right now is that there's too much information and everybody's walking around knowing about photography, but they, they're missing the beginning part. So you don't need to be a beginner to take this class because believe me, you are probably missing something in your, in your photography education. So you'll really like it. I teach it. I'm there with you while you're watching so I can answer questions right away. You're going to have homework that you have to turn in to me. <laughs> I'm nice, don't worry, and lots and lots of support. Um, and then also we, ha we have some video courses about software, and our format is very short little video to teach you a little. And then once you get that, you go to the next video. Short little videos, a little piece of like if you want to learn Photoshop, a little tiny piece of Photoshop at a time. So you learn in small increments. And people really like that way of learning. So check out understandphotography.com for our Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. And you live in Scottsdale, Arizona. I do. Yes. So you've come a long way, baby. I came a long way, but you kept the weather nice for me. Oh, it's been beautiful. <laughs> well, beautiful. a little cool for me. That's okay. We have to get 115 in Arizona in the summer. I'll take a little cool. It's good. Is it really? Mm. <laughs> wow. I would probably like it. It's nice. It's, you <laughs> I know, like to be warm. It's dry. They joke. It's a dry heat. It is. <laughs> I don't get that though because it's just as hot. It's hot, but people you say dry heat's not as hot. I think it's just as hot. It's no? hot, but it's it's different. You could go swimming, no lie, at midnight, and it'll be a hundred degrees out. But the humidity is only maybe five percent. You'll get out of that pool and you'll be freezing. It's like putting alcohol on your skin. It it just wow. wicks away the moisture so quickly. It really is different. It's a different heat. Yeah. I haven't. I've spent a little time in Arizona just once. I, I had a long road trip to California and then back, but I went to California from here, Naples, yeah. Florida, and yeah, then I yeah. went to Atlanta. And so I, I, I basically did I-10 and then yeah. I-40. So I got a little oh, bit yeah, of Arizona yeah, both ways. Part. Yeah. So it was fun. It's I a liked pretty it. State. Different. You drive but you're two not hours. from there. No, Michigan originally. Yeah. Where are you from? In Michigan. Uh, I'm from Michigan. You are. Yeah. Oh, that's why I like you. High so five, much. girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> right. I follow uh, Gander. <laughs> so originally, I grew up about 50 miles northeast of Detroit, in a little town called Marine City, right on the Canadian border. Oh, I never heard yeah. of it. Where about oh. you? Where are you I'm from, from the west side of Detroit. Oh, where? I went to high school in Livonia. I grew up oh, yeah. in Detroit, but okay. I, I went to high school in Livonia. I know that area well. I used to work out that way. Did yeah. you? Yeah. And then Such uh, a small world. Went to grad school at Central Michigan University and then lived in Grand Rapids and then moved to Arizona in 06. Wow. Yeah, so. Ah, so yeah. you've been there a while. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to be warm. It is wonderful. <laughs> I don't have to shovel the sunshine. <laughs> now, you are mostly... I mean, your income as a photographer is mostly from teaching and 
leading workshops, am I correct? Teaching and leading workshops and, you know, some other things from time to time and, of course, image licensing when, when um, those opportunities arise. But uh, I love teaching. I love helping people do what they want to do and do it better and do it maybe in a different way or a more fun way. Uh, so teaching's in my blood, although I've never been a classroom teacher. I used to work as an educational psychologist in the schools uh, where I would help kids with learning disabilities and do a lot of prevention. And I did a lot of professional development for schools and districts and consulting on best practices and instruction. So I've always enjoyed doing instruction well. Okay. Um, and so I, I like teaching, whether it's photography or anything else, but photography, of course, I love to shoot, but I truly yeah. love to teach just as much. That's so, awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. And what a great way to make a living when you're doing what you love. Yeah, I, I do. I really do. Yeah. So, for yeah, because you get to be taking pictures and teaching at the same time. It's yeah. like a, yeah. it's like utopia. It is. It is. <laughs> and, and, you know, and when you see the light turn on for someone and they're able to do something they couldn't figure out how to do before, and then they come back and they tag you on Facebook and you, look what I was able to do since your class. I mean, that is joy. You know, you I get agree. to help people on their own journey. and and. That is truly joy. So. I, I totally, totally agree with you. <laughs> um, now, you're here in, in this area because you were one of the speakers at a big photography conference from put on by the Florida Camera <laughs> Club Council. Yes. <laughs> and their website is f3c.org. If you're a Florida photographer, that's the statewide group. Yes. So it was a good yeah. conference. Did you do well? You, you liked it? You know what? It? it was a wonderful conference. I thought it was well run. I thought everybody was incredibly friendly it had the right mix of small enough to feel personal and not overwhelming but big enough that you had great names of people presenting and teaching and all these uh, breakout sessions and workshops you know all day things you could do you know going to destination places and uh, you know an exhibit hall that was full of wonderful vendors and I thought it was a wonderful event and I've been around a few of them and I thought this was especially yeah, nice. So, I, I yeah. agree it's good. Okay so we're going to talk about classic versus artistic wildlife photography. Yeah. I missed that in the introduction. Yes. So what do you mean by that? So let's start there. Yeah <laughs> so you've photographed wildlife. I've seen pictures of it on your wall in here in your studio right? In, a little in, bit. A little bit. Not a lot. I'm not a big wildlife photographer. But I've seen it. You've done I've it. I've done it. Oh certainly <laughs> I've done, done it. it. Yeah, if you've there's done something it. wild there I'm gonna shoot it. Shoot it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So so classic versus uh, you know more artistic or, or modern wildlife photography. This is probably my own terminology you know it's not something you're gonna go look up in Wikipedia but I've really started to observe over the years, you know, these these two different trends. So one meaning anybody that's a nature photographer, and I've been one since I was a kid, you know, you want to go out, you get your long lens, you zoom in tight, you want it to be sharp and, you know, clear and well exposed and all of those things. And it looks beautiful and, and, and everything. And then, you know, as you get more and more evolved with your wildlife photography, now to separate yourself from what I call the documentation shots, now you're looking for the special moments, you know, feeding behavior or in flight or whatever it might be, you know, something, this amazing moment, this one in a million moment, and now that's differentiating you. Okay. So all these wildlife photographers start out, you know, okay, I got the shot and it's clear, I'm happy, and then it's, oh, yeah. I got the shot of them feeding or flying or whatever it is. What ends up happening is after a while, you've, you're like, okay, I can do it all. Now it's going to the further away places or the really, really special one in a billion moments. And, and I find that that's a really hard place to live all the time because so many moments become boring to you because you've been there, done it, shot mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. you know. And a good example, if anybody's you know, listening, is go to you know, Google Images or Bing and just type in your favorite animal and go to the images page and just look and you will find that there are so many images that are like so many other images of it. Yeah, you know? they all look the same after a while. Yeah, of. yeah. yeah. And I say like the world probably doesn't need another picture of a great blue heron here and standing there. Like, you know, there's a million pictures of that already. So what do we do to be different? Um, so on that classic note, mm -hmm. that's really your classic wildlife photography, right? You know, the stuff, and I'll ask people, where do you typically see wildlife photography, right? Okay. It's in the magazines, it's in a calendar, it's online, you know, in our mm -hmm. Facebook groups or, you know, Instagram or what have you. Uh, but it lives in these very classic places where it's designed to live. And, you know, I, I call it like the Nat Geo style of images, right? You go into the magazines and you see these vibrant, beautiful images. I am right. not putting the images down. They're amazing. Yeah, they are. 
but it's one style of wildlife photography. Okay. okay. And I feel like as we have more and more photographers out there doing that, it's getting it's getting over overdone. It, you know, it's like there's it's hard to be innovative in this very classic style. And so when people will ask me, well, and I, I hear it all the time in the industry, I want to be able to sell my wildlife. How can I sell my wildlife images? And when you look at design and decorating trends today, these classic images live and breathe and are beautiful in magazines and calendars and, mm. you know, in certain print, but not necessarily over your bedroom wall, right? Ah. I don't want a picture of a bear eating a bloody salmon dripping over my head at night, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> So we really have to think in the context of the, you know, like any other business, what is the market asking for and what are the markets? And I just feel, uh, and not that this is a conversation about selling your work, but um, you really have to be honest with you're expecting an image that really belongs in one form, in one place, in one market to transfer into others. And I think that's a little bit unrealistic in some that cases. That is so. really good stuff, <laughs> man. I never... I don't know why I didn't think of that like that. You're right. I mean, some people like the wildlife stuff on their wall. And in the commercial, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. sells commercially, mm -hmm. like in a commercial building, yes. you'll see that kind of yes. stuff. Yes. But you're right. I don't want, I don't want a bear yeah. eating. I don't even, like people take pictures of bugs. Yeah. They're like literally into taking yeah. pictures of bugs. Yeah. I don't want a bug on my wall. I right. live in Florida. I got enough bugs. Right, <laughs> right. Seriously. And those, I mean, they're amazing. The quality, you know, the, the folks... And whether you label yourself as an amateur, hobbyist, professional, semi-pro, whatever, doesn't matter what you call yourself. There are a lot of talented photographers out there and skilled photographers. Take these gorgeous pictures. Um, and so, and they're gorgeous, but they work really well in journals and magazines and maybe science and research types of things. But, you know, this Not gorgeous picture small. of a black widow spider isn't going to go in my kitchen, you know. So. so what would be the first step? Let's say, okay, here, I live in southwest Florida, and we yes. are known for our birds. Yes. We have many great blue herons. We have... Yeah. You yeah. know, some of them just are artistic because they feather up and they do these cool, like those, mm -hmm. you know, they cool dances and stuff oh, like do. that. But they what do. about just like a boring old blue heron? Sorry, blue herons, because I love blue herons. <laughs> I, do I too. love them. <laughs> but I do what, too. what could you do to make that an artistic picture? Yeah. Would it be in processing and shooting or? Yes and yes. Yes and yes. Yes and yes. <laughs> so, so, how I approach it, and I start this out a lot. In, in any of the classes that I teach is starting with the end first in mind. And it may be a little challenging because we don't always know perhaps where that end is or you don't literally have a place where you know for sure it's going to go. You don't have a client that says, yes, I would like a six by eight of this heron on the wall. You know, you don't have that. But imagine a place and go through, you know, again, I'm going to pick on Google or Bing or whatever your search engine is of choice. And go in and look at some homes. Go flip through a Better Homes and Gardens magazine. Go look at interiors and imagine what might work in those interiors. And then just give yourself an exercise and go out and shoot for it. And so instead of thinking of the classic, you know, the heron standing there and, you know, maybe it's got a fish in its mouth or all of that, get rid of that thinking. Not that that's not wrong. It does have a place. But now I want you to go out and say, Hmm, what is this room that I imagine? What does it have in it? Is it ethereal? Is it gauzy? Is it very contemporary? Is it more uh, farmhouse style? Like what is, what is the interior? Now what can I imagine with that heron picture and how would I need to shoot it in order to have it work in that environment? So let's pick farmhouse style, right? It's kind of shabby chic, you know, usually okay. light and airy kind of feeling, some wood, rustic. Okay. Um, if we go for that environment, then I might take a great blue heron and I'm going to look for an environment. Maybe it's going to be, uh, could be, you know, not that herons are typically on a farm, but it might be somewhere with wide open space. And it might be where I have a really clean background, a light background, or shoot it up towards the sky and overexpose that sky so it goes nearly white. Mm. Um, give it lots of negative space and present it with you know, it, perhaps on that mantle, if you've got one of those rustic wood mantles and, you know, prop it up on that mantle, print it as a canvas or, you know, you could frame it if you want to. But think about it as an interior decorative piece than just your classic you know, magazine photography. So, you're such a good teacher, but you oh. know what? When you said that, I actually, I went to work on what would I do to shoot yeah. it differently? Yeah. 
and yeah. it was nothing like what you said. <laughs> but that's cool, right? That's the artist in you. <laughs> but I visualized in a wooded environment, mm. like with, and then making it really hard and crusty, like Whoa. bringing the clarity structure yeah. up, yeah. and then putting them in an old barn wood frame. And why not? And it's so yeah. funny. Yeah. You did, yours was all and this. Well, you know, maybe open the, space, and I'm thinking, <laughs> it was so funny. It depends that, on the room, though, that we're envisioning, because I just painted very broad strokes, right? So, but I love, I, I think this is the whole point of the exercise. What is it envisioned differently when you put it in the context of something than just, I'm at the lake, and I'm going to go shoot this bird, and it's going to be, you made it you a know, whole different thing. I'm ready. I'm, I'm yeah, done. All right, yeah. let's end the show. I've got, <laughs> I got homework to do. <laughs> <laughs> the girl who doesn't like to do wildlife is going to go out and do wildlife. Yeah. <laughs> I like yeah. those shooting, and this is one of your sayings, right? Shooting with a purpose? Shooting with a purpose, yeah. Give yourself little self-assignments. Or a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, I'll you know, be wherever I am, right? I was on Sanibel Island a couple days ago because I'm here and I love it. And, um, you know, where are you? What is, what is the environment saying to you? And what kind of feeling are you getting from it? I, I, and maybe it's my background as a former psychologist, but I shoot with a lot of what am I feeling right now in my head? You know, like what, what is the, what is the area, the colors, the, the, you know, what kind of feeling is it giving back? And I want to kind of shoot for that, right? So if it's a really, you know, it might be a beautiful evening and maybe a little bit hazy, then I might go that direction. Or if it's okay. stormy, I, you know, yeah. but um, shoot with that feeling and then think about where could it go. And once you kind of think about a bunch of different places it could go, instead of just going, boy, it would be nice if this picture ended up in X magazine someday, like that's your only bucket you could put that picture in. Right. It really gets limiting. And, um, and I find that we all get kind of frustrated because most of us, you know, and I say us, all of us love photography. Whoever's listening probably really enjoys it at some level, pro, amateur, or somewhere in between. And um, it feels sort of unachievable for many people. And my gosh, what would you rather have truly at the end of the day, although magazines are wonderful and I'm so grateful for have being published in them. Yeah, and you've been published nationally a lot, yes, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Actually today, in fact, um, again with Arizona Highways, but um, in their blog today. but. What would you rather have, honestly, at the end of the day, person to person? That's a wonderful accomplishment, and I'm not going to knock it, and I would love to do it 100 times over. But people look you know, at, at things, a magazine for a month, and then it's gone or it's archived. But putting something in someone's home that might be there 10 years, yeah. you know, I mean, that's, it's just a different way to think about how your work is respected and appreciated and what you contribute to somebody else's life with through your work. So, You know, it's funny because I... Um, before I had the studio, I had, you know, I do a lot of family portraits. So I had all these family portraits up in my home of people I yeah. didn't even know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I knew yeah. them, obviously. Yeah. I took their but. picture. But my son has never lived in that house because I moved there after he moved out. And then I finally put some of my Cuba pictures up. My son, who has known me all his life, oh, right? Yeah. He's like, oh, these pictures are really good. Like, I don't think my son has ever looked at any of my pictures in his life. You know oh, what I mean? Other than yeah. the, unless I took it to yeah. him. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, of course, yeah. But until they were on my wall. And yeah. he was, like, surprised that I was a good photographer. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Yes. <laughs> but you're so right, Peggy. Printing something yeah. on the wall brings a whole different feeling to it. You know, we get so saturated with images on social media. And, I mean, I love social media. It's awesome. Again, nothing I'm saying is a bad thing. I, you know, I love the magazines. I but there are more things and more ways to experience photography. And I think people, when you post to social media and you get in the game of, you know, do I like it? Do I like it? And clicking likes and, you know, and all that stuff. Um, it's such a fast paced thing. And when you print something and you put it on the wall for people to see and stare at for more than four seconds as you scroll by and it's bigger and you get to see the details you don't get to see in a, you know, little phone screen or whatnot. It just takes a totally different life to yeah. it. And, yeah. Yeah. All right, so you're beginning with the end in mind, which is one of the seven habits of highly effective people, by the way. Hey, did thanks. you know that? No, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good, actually, I shouldn't say it's a good book because I, I tried to read the book. It's a hard read. It's a hard I listened book, yeah. to the audio book. <laughs> you said you love a, a podcast and things, so yeah. <laughs> but that is one of the seven habits. Begin oh. with the end in mind. Well, we'll start there then. But it's a good thing to do. It really, really is. It, it gives you direction. It gives you inspiration, you know, and, and I'm all about being, you know, a little, uh, you know, 
scattered out there and looking for whatever speaks to you. But when you go out with an intention, it doesn't mean you can't shoot other things, but when you go out with an intention, I'm going to try to accomplish this today. And, and it, 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 you have a design in mind, you have a feeling in mind, a color palette maybe. Those kinds of things can really give you some direction and, and purpose and uh, you have more fun, you know, and then you, you get the result in the end. So, so what else can you think of? Because I didn't think of that until just now when you said it, that yeah. think about where it might hang on a wall, look yeah. at an interior design, a yeah. farmhouse. Okay, now I've got an assignment. I'm going to go and find yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah. you just said color would, was another color, thing? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, what, were, the, what are some concrete things yeah. that somebody, yeah. you know, for me, People say, oh, you're so creative. I honestly don't feel like I'm a real creative person. I think I'm sort of right in the middle. Yeah. I'm not left brain. I'm not right brain. I'm sort of right in the middle. There's some benefits to that, honestly. But, but I really think that creativity can be learned. Yeah. And so, I, but when I'm learning, I need concrete examples. Absolutely. So people, sometimes people on the show, they'll go, oh, you know, well, how do you, how do you come up with these mm -hmm. ideas? Mm -hmm. Oh, I just mm -hmm. feel it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't help me as a person who needs. I yeah. need you to say, visualize a farmhouse. Yes, you know. Yes. So, or exactly. visualize a color. Yes. Choose a color palette. Yes. What What else could we do besides yeah. looking interior design magazines yeah. to get, I get ideas, ideas for, for interiors? House. We could do color schemes. Yes, you can certainly do color schemes, and and I encourage people to shoot in a series of things because, uh, well, here's a good exercise. Um, one of the things that I do, uh, that I did, kind of proof of concept that that classic wildlife photography doesn't end up on people's walls, was I went to Pinterest and I literally did a variety of search terms like wildlife photography decorative or nature photography art. And I tried to find what are people out there on Pinterest, you know, as one source, mm -hmm. posting. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting. You couldn't find hardly anything. And so, uh, but what I did see were trends in decorating styles. And what's trendy right now, um, not that you have to shoot for trends, but if you, you know, you want it in someone's house, we're talking about classic versus more decorative, modern, contemporary. Uh, one thing is, are things in series or things in galleries? Um, things that are monochromatic, black and white, or pick a color scheme. Um, things that, you know, you'll have all similar framing or you'll have all, you know, kind of a similar style and they're all put together on the wall in one place, whether on a long wall, you know, on a row or mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. a collage, what have you. So start with that. Once you understand that, then you can start to look at some of the rules about how to make collages that work in certain um, components to the measurements that you want to put together and, uh, you know, bigger print should probably be more towards the middle, things, you know, towards the edge that are smaller. Um, there's a variety of, you can read up on those things, but now that I say, okay, I'm going to shoot as a collage, I'm going to make this artistic piece as a collage of images instead of just, here's my great blue heron standing there. Uh -huh. Now I've got some pieces and parts to play with. So now I might shoot the heron and then I, I might do some post-processing things to make it more artistic and there's a hundred ways you can go with that. But then I might say, okay, well this heron, I took it, I'm gonna make something up. I took it at sunset and this house has some of those um, cool blue and warm kind of uh, peachy colors in it, let's say, right? Oh, beachy okay. colors. I'm oh, okay. making up this house as we go along. Okay. Um, <laughs> I wanna buy it before this. we're done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, let's say it has that color palette in it. Okay, well then if I've got the heron and the heron has some of those blue colors in it and even a little bit of the, some of those warmer tones, and then I might go and shoot an abstract of the sky at sunset. Or maybe if we're near a beach, I might go photograph a few seashells. Or maybe I'll go find a few other abstract textures or water ripples or um, you know, maybe another scene with the heron. Maybe here it is and then here it's flying or um, you know, I'm just kind of ad-libbing some ideas. But when you start to shoot with a color palette in mind and you start to do things that are from the macro to the micro, and you put these things together on the wall, they all tie in together. They all have the same color palette mm -hmm. and feel, but now you've got different elements and people enjoy looking at it. It's kind of like if you went to a buffet and they only had mashed potatoes versus there's all these other lovely fruits yeah. and vegetables and things and they all kind of go together. And so I like to think about those things in shooting in a series. And it also gives you more shooting time because instead of standing there for six hours waiting for the heron to do something one in a billion, mm -hmm. um, now you're going, okay, yeah, I know the heron's there, but I can also photograph these other things and tie pieces together. And that becomes more valuable 
as a body of work to to go to someone and say, hey, I've got these pieces and they can go together in 74 different ways. Uh, and, and even some of them shoot on a, on a uh, monochromatic color palette, like let's say the warm colors. Well, I can put that in Photoshop now and I can color match through changing the hue. So if your room's lavender, but I happened to shoot it and it was a, you know, a orange sky, some abstract thing, I could go and color match to your room. Yeah. So it gives you all of this flexibility in, in the ways you can That's design. That's so cool. And you know, I have a class called Selling Your Photography yes, as Art. Yes, And yes. this is the stuff that we teach that really? says sell your art in, in a series. Yes. But yes. I don't know, I didn't think about it in, from the back end where you, where you have to start uh, yeah. and shoot it in a series and think about what can you do with this, whatever your subject yeah. is. Yes. Yes. Well, could I do this as a series? You know, what about exactly. a landscape? What could we do with a landscape oh, that would be yeah. a series? You're asking me. I'm asking you because yeah. you're good right. at this, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, you know, I'm and, picking your brain, no, girl. <laughs> that's, no, it's good. Hey, that's why I'm here. Um, but, uh, but again, with the landscape. So, so landscape. Let's just take for an example what people people classically want to do with a landscape in the house, and they'll put it over the mantel, the sofa, the headboard, wherever. Some big space, right? You've got this beautiful landscape, blow it up as big as it can stand or that'll fit in the house and it's gorgeous as the main actor in right. the house. Okay. And this is one of the challenges that I found in wildlife photography and any nature photography is we tend to always shoot what I call the main actor photos. So where are the supporting actor photos, okay. right? And if you, and I'm guilty of it myself, you know, I used to be a floral designer and I worked with interior designers oh. and decorators for 15 years. Oh, so so yeah. design and decoration has been in my blood. Uh, and then I went into psychology and it, it's different. I but know, you're it all, all over relates. the place. But, <laughs> uh, but it all kind of comes back together in the end, which I love. But um, mm -hmm. so imagine if we had this, you know, this big landscape and it is of, what do you want it to be of? Um, um, well, of course, here we have the Everglades with the big clouds in the summer. Okay, big clouds in the summer, we big got storm reflections. clouds, reflections, water, gorgeous, lots of green and blues. And we've and got cypress trees yeah. and pine trees. Right. So very tropical, very beautiful piece. Okay. So that goes, I'm going to make something up. That goes as a 40 by 70 over your mantle. Okay, huge, gorgeous, stunning, wow, you know, walk in the room. It can't help but be noticed. Okay. But then what do you do on the rest of the walls? And here's what I see people that love to shoot. And then they want to print their work, which I applaud. I think printing is awesome. Then you've got all these other pieces that try to be main actors in the same room and they're all competing with one another. So you've got the heron that you blew up and you've got your, you know, picture the rainbow and you've got your, you know, seashells and the lighthouse and all these other things, right, that you shot in Florida. And they're all screaming at each other and no, they nothing is tied together. together. Okay. So if you've got this big landscape, well, you just said you had cypress, you had water, you had reflections. Imagine if you just took pieces and parts of a cypress uh -huh. now, or you did maybe the silhouette if it was, you know, sunset with the uh -huh. clouds and whatnot. And now that is a smaller piece over the maybe chair. Maybe just the one tree or something. The one tree, uh -huh. right. Oh. Or you Or maybe the reflection in the colors. Exactly. And put it into a triptych or diptych uh -huh. and, and put that somewhere, right? You've got an accent room or hallway that needs something, you know, maybe five, ten by tens of something going down that hallway. But they all have the same color palette. They all go in with your room. And, you know, when I used to do interior, uh, I did the floral design piece, but I'd work with the interior decorators. You know, it was very specific. It was, we need this big piece here, and we need smaller pieces here, and they have to have this level of this color and this amount of accent color. I recommend to people go read up on color harmony and, and, and color theory, and that can really help you as well of understanding yeah. what colors go together and how to work with color. So this is so helpful. Yeah, it's fun. This is <laughs> something else. Aww. Now, do you think so? Do you think a more artistic print will sell? It does over a, a it, classic print. You know, it depends again on the environment. So if I'm going to go and create a artistic picture, it certainly will, I shouldn't say certainly, but probably not go in Nat Geo or, you know, any other of the wildlife classic, you know, outdoor photography, those magazines. That has a different purpose, a different audience, and they have different needs. My pictures are also not going to be your contest pictures because the contest, and this is one thing I'll say, um, do contests. I love contests. They're great. There's so many different uh, contests out there. And I say they're great. Do watch the fine print because some are not as great when it comes to the fine print. But there's some really okay. great opportunities out there to do classic photography and learn the classic way of doing it. But then when you go into this artistic side, put that aside. This is a different genre. This is, put on your creative hat. 
there's not as many rules. Let yourself be more free. Um, so then from there, you know, it, you can get inspired by a lot of different things, a lot of different textures, a lot of different um, just challenges you can set up for yourself and, and do something a little bit more unique and creative. So, <laughs> I think. So, all right. So, who's... Who, who will buy this? What demographic yes. is looking to buy this kind of work? And, and, yeah. and, and I don't really have a visualization yet because yeah. it could be, you could take that bird and make it, you know, into a pencil yes. drawing and you could be Absolutely. very abstract or something Absolutely. or it could be closer to a classic or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. But who, who's going to buy this stuff? Where are you going to sell it too? Yeah, so it's a wonderful question. So if people are going to sell and you're, you're designing beyond your own home or your friends and family's home, to me, and, and this is something that I'm exploring more and more now, so I probably don't have all the answers yet, but to me, you're, you're selling instead of, and it can go there too with the super high-end fine art, um, but to me, you're, you're selling to what there are the most of out there, a typical person who wants something unique, something creative, but that still goes in your house. And so I like to think about designing things for the everyday person that, you know, I mean, look at Pinterest, look at these magazines. It doesn't mean you have to look at the $5 million house, you know, but look at the current trends today. What are people buying and design for that. And what I love about this is, you know, I'm still such a lover of wildlife okay. and I can still take a real subject, a real bird, a real whatever it is, you know, bird, bug, anything, and I can create it into something that takes the wildlife, preserves the essence of it, but makes it more palatable for today's art and makes it something people want to hang in your home. So I have a gallery right now that's all done. Um, it's for the month of March and it's all in vintage wildlife photography and some landscapes from Arizona. So it's all done in a very vintage way thick paper that it's printed on, hand deckled, lots of oh. texture, uh, built on reclaimed wood backdrops that I've built with my dad. My dad and I had fun doing this project Aww. together. And I've brought in found objects, so that's a whole other layer. So if you took a picture of a beach, go find a piece of driftwood and go do that as a triptych and mount that piece of driftwood right in front of all of those three pictures that you just printed on canvas or what have you. Okay. Bring in some different elements. Go put a shadow box with some seashells in it and incorporate that in your gallery of prints. Oh, just wow. mix and match your different media, you know, but these are the things that are in. And if you're going to be looking for to sell something, you have to have what people are interested in purchasing. That's so such a great point. And that I think it's difficult for photographers because we have egos yeah. and we want to shoot what we want to shoot and we want you to buy what we want to shoot yes. <laughs> yes. and that's not realistic in all cases. Exactly. Sometimes it is. Sometimes you know you, you really do have that gift but for most of us you know we may like for me I'm technically a pretty good photographer. I've seen your work. It's beautiful. But, but I, yeah, but I struggle sometimes to me. I think I struggle yeah. with the creativity. Yeah. Not as much as I did because I really do think you can learn to be creative. I, I do really too. do. And it's experiential. And it's, it's, it's not you are or you aren't. <sighs> creative yes. people, it's iterative. I discovered one little thing and then from there it sprouts five new ideas. And then you got to go and discover something else and then you build on all this accumulation of ideas. Creativity is, to me, it is not you are or you aren't. I've had guys come to my classes and say, I'm an engineer, you're the first person that's made me think creatively and I am loving this new life because they never saw themselves as creative. And I think creativity is just a matter of learning this, it's a skill like anything else. It's, you right? gotta, like yeah. you said, you got to exercise that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. for me, who is that kind of and I, I'm not really a left brain person. I mean, I'm not that smart. You know, I, the technical stuff comes hard for me. But I, I feel like when you said, I need the concrete instructions, yeah. and then from yeah. there, yeah. you yeah. know, there's a wedding photographer. For, she's a friend of mine here in town, and she's pretty much the most popular f wedding photographer in this town. And she's very creative. But she's the most left brain person you ever met. Yeah. But she has so yeah. much experience. Yeah. And you know, you look at the pictures, you go, oh, I can do that. But then yeah. she can put a spin on it. Yes. But yeah. could she do that right away? I don't think so. No, it's but it just, as she kept yeah. practicing, her creativity yeah. kept coming out more and more and more and more. That's and I think it. that happens for me too. Now, when you're yeah. shooting, do you 
like do you have a favorite lens or do you think mm. like mixing up the lenses mm -hmm. helps mm -hmm. you or what it, what's your opinion so, on that? So good question. Um, so if I go out up front and I'm like, I'm going to shoot for creative purposes today, it doesn't mean that I can't go shoot the classic stuff, but I am looking at the scenes in different ways to evaluate the potential of a scene for a creative shot versus your classic, you know, use the great blue here and catching a frog or something. Uh -huh. um, I'm thinking differently about it now. I'm going to use the light differently. I might shoot middle of the day with, you know, white skies because that's going to work well for me for that where it might be horrible for a magazine shot. So I go out kind of with a different mindset up front. Okay. Not that I can't mix and match, but for me personally, I don't do very well kind of doing a little of that and a little of that. I, I kind of like to zone in and get your brain trained around that line of thinking. Okay. Um, so for me, that's where I'll start. But then as far as lenses and things go, um, I think a variety or a good couple of zoom lenses can work well because if you're shooting for this gallery concept that I gave you, which was, you know, something abstract, something, you know, the bird, the landscape, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're, you are giving people a variety of, of focal distances with those images, you know, that you need different focal distances to do that. So um, a good zoom or two could be really, really good to do it. Um, you know, I've sh I shoot with a variety of things. Most recently I've been shooting with the Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter lens, the G2, and um, this coming from a girl who's been a dedicated Canon 500 prime, you know, shooter for years. Wow. Um, it was a big switch, but you know what? It's, it, I have had so much fun. It's not as heavy, too. It's I not bet. as heavy. It's like wearing a <laughs> cotton ball in relationship to the other lenses. But um, it has opened up a lot of creativity and giving me more flexibility to shoot more quickly and um, both in the classic sense and in the more creative sense because okay. now I can try different, I can go and see a landscape and then I can go quickly zoom in and go, let me just take that piece of the sky. Oh. I just want that or this little element here and um, it just allows me to piece together these uh, concepts that, you know, I was kind of either shooting with a second body all the time or stuck at that 500 millimeter focal length. And you know what, I think that's one of the things that the lens manufacturers are paying attention to. Yeah. Because it seemed, you know, the rule of thumb has basically been the longer you yeah. know, the more the range, yeah. the less the quality. Yeah. But yeah. they seem to be getting better at having Absolutely. these, like, I think Tamron has a 28 to 300 yeah. or something like yeah. that. And, yeah. and it's a pretty yeah. good quality all the way through. I have been very impressed with the recent, um, I've been a pretty staunch Canon shooter, and this was my first venture outside of it. And I took it very seriously. I tested the heck out of the variety of lenses in that zoom range and um, came away with my decision. But it has been, uh, it's opened up so many new doors that I haven't been used to having open because I've shot it at a, with a prime lens for years. Um, and, you know, and I've always kind of looked and went, yeah, yeah, zoom, but the quality isn't there, the clarity isn't there. Those issues are largely over, I, in, in my opinion now. Yeah. Amazing, the amazing. stuff they're coming out with. Yeah. I mean, because it's true. I mean, we're so used to lugging all this heavy equipment. Yes. And, yes. you know, I mean, you're still young, but I'm getting old. Oh. I don't want to ha carry all that heavy stuff around anymore. Yeah. And, they, yeah. and the manufacturers are really addressing those, and I like that. Yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you this, this is, the, this is a first for me since 2011, 2012, when I first got my 500 Prime. I did not come to Florida with it. I brought my 150 to 600 only and had a, just a ton of fun shooting with it in the spare time. But that's a first. That's a big step for me who has been dedicated. And I mean, that lens is still a gorgeous lens. Nothing wrong with it. But when I'm trying to teach and shoot and, you know, having that big lens and also trying to work with people when I'm leading wor workshops and things, it's so cumbersome. It's hard to teach and lug it around. And, and it was so nice to have this, this much more flexible lens. Still a heavy but lens, but, not, yeah, but, <laughs> but nothing, nothing compared to yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've really, uh, I, it's been a joy. So anyway. So for yeah. artistic, if you know you're shooting artistic, it's good to have a zoom lens. I think so. I mean, I, you know, shoot with the thing that you're comfortable with um, and know, again, it all goes to what are you trying to do from the onset. But I think a zoom lens gives you some quick flexibility and creativity um, and allows you to get a variety of things. And you know what? If you really want to get fussy with it, have the zoom lens, and then if there's something you just absolutely feel like you need a different lens for, well, then go put it on. Yeah. Uh, but I think if you're just trying to break into being more creative, 
Um, and, and I'll say this, use all of your tools. The tools that we have, start with your mind, start with that point of inspiration, then go into the shooting and the location that you're going to do and keep it an open mind and looking and seeing what's out there. Move away from looking at the Facebook post or magazine post of photography for a while. Start looking at art. Start looking at trends. Go to Target or Walmart and walk around and see what they have. I'm not mm. saying you want to shoot for that, but look at what's in right now and think about how you can translate some of those things. Put your own spin on them mm. from you know nature out there to what's going to sell in someone's house. I mean, I did a spa recently and it was all just leaves. And so all the leaves had to be color matched, but you know, I was just focused on different leaves. But then in post-processing, I can work on the color matching. I can work on, uh, like you saying, you know, changing some of the texture and things of it with clarity and some of these different things to, to create something a little bit more abstracted from our classic, here's the leaf and perfect focus. Mm -hmm. And preserving enough of the original integrity of the subject, it's still our nature but putting an artistic spin on it enough, and there's a thousand ways you could do that, uh, but making it something so that it's, it's more contemporary and a little more on the artistic okay. side. Yeah, a little more abstracted, so. Now, what, what else, as far as shooting, are, yeah. are there any, like, do you ever do like creative techniques or do you use mm, filter, yeah. like the kind of filters yeah. that go on your camera, not yeah. the kind in the Photoshop? Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, anything like that? Absolutely. So one of my What about Lens Baby? Ever lose? You know, I was just talking about <laughs> Lens Baby yesterday and I have not yet had the pleasure to play with Lens Baby, but I'm open to doing so because I've seen some lovely things from them. Uh, but no, I haven't had the chance to, to do Lens Baby yet. Um, but um, one of my favorite things to do is slow motion blur and panning shots um, because I think they can really blend uh, kind of the reality of things and take it into a surreal place. Mm -hmm. And I always, I, my personal style is very ethereal and open and lots of negative space and gauzy kinds of things. Those are, that's kind of the style that I gravitate towards. Okay. And so um, for me, you know, using those slow shutter shots, um, you know, panning on a subject, a bird flying in or a leaf fluttering down or um, moving your camera to create blur or slow motion on the water, what have you, those kinds of things where it just abstracts it a little bit. I kind of have a soft spot for abstract. <laughs> um, soft stuff or soft pictures. I do, right? <laughs> I, do, I, do right? yeah. I shoot blurry all the time. It's awesome. <laughs> In fact, I laugh because I'll teach classes sometimes. I'm like, you want it a little blurrier. And people that are not part of the class will walk by and are probably like, never take a class from her. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but um, no, I love uh, that look. So I really love, you know, shooting birds that one fifteenth of a second and really and it takes practice so everybody doing it panning is hard it's hard it's hard but i love panning too i do too it's but just it fun. is hard it is so i try to teach patient. it and people get so frustrated it's like you, you this is just you just gotta keep yeah. practicing you're yeah. you're getting the concept yeah. now you just gotta keep practicing it's exactly right and it's, it's easy to practice because you just walk outside yeah. and do the cars going exactly. by exactly you know? cars bike dog anything anything that's moving um, and, and it just takes time to match up that focus point with, you know, with the pace of the subject shooting. But you know what? It, here's, here's my thing when it's a horrible day. Like I was just in Bosque National Park, uh, Bosque uh, Del Apache Wildlife Refuge in New Mexico in December teaching a workshop. I stayed a couple days later to do some personal shooting and we had really overcast skies okay. and really low light, not just soft light, but low light. It was a kind of a dark and dreary day like this is the epitome for me to be able to shoot panning shots because you can you know have the skies blown out if you want to and you get these slow shots and they become really artistic if you got a white sky now you can color match for a room or paint in a little extra color i mean the sky's the limit no pun intended of what you can do on those gray days so I, you know for me i was all over it <laughs> but that's great, though. You took it as a challenge. In I did. A way. It yeah. Was so much more. So what? Fun. It's great. I can deal with That's this. Right. I'll find That's a, right. I'll find a new way yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So what about? Do you ever like just take? Okay, I've got this classic picture of this great blue heron. Do you yeah. ever just say, "Well, I'm going to jazz this up in Photoshop"? Sure. Absolutely. Um, it, it. But it's interesting when I when I do, I almost have a harder time doing it with the pictures that I've shot really well in that classic sense. Oh, because you don't want to all wreck, the color don't wreck them. <laughs> I don't want to wreck them, but, <laughs> but regardless, I mean, I can always copy it and, you know. Yeah, that's but, true. Um, 
I find that when I'm looking for my classic work, if, if anybody's looking at my classic work, there's usually a lot of color there, there's a lot of um, you know, detail and things, and I find that the more detail there is throughout the image, the harder it is to do my style of artistic, which is more of that gauzy, ethereal, oh, lots of negative space. Okay. So they may not necessarily work together. Some work beautifully, um, some not at all, it just depends. Um, but I find that it's a matter of training your brain to think differently. I don't know how many people out there like to shoot a lot of the time with their long lens and they go and do the zoomy bird pictures, right? And then if I said, go put on your macro lens, we're gonna shoot macro today, kind of takes a while to get your head wrapped around it mm -hmm. and into it. Sort of the same thing. So I, you know, switch from one philosophy to another of what I'm going to shoot, but it, it you know, you kind of got to get into it. Okay. So, um, so you don't do that often, I don't though. do that very often. I'm usually shooting one way or the other. But you know what's funny what works, and I'm going to encourage everyone listening to do this. Go in your sock drawer, right? The old hard drive's full of stuff that you never look at anymore. And there's going to be stuff in there. And you called it your sock drawer? <laughs> sock those drawer, are hard right? Drives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, the sock drawer, you shove stuff in there and you never look yeah. at it again. And there's like missing pieces of things and randomness. Um, go in there and go look for things that have new potential. Because we, we tend to shoot with one idea in mind and it may or may not turn out that day. But you'll find that there are things when you start thinking more artistically that you can use pieces or parts of or do something different with in post-processing. And all of a sudden it becomes a whole new life with this image and I've taken images that I have shot that were on the worst settings you know you, you shot something quick and forgot to change a setting and it's all you know dark or whatever um, and I have taken things that were 100% throwaways I would have never posted to the public and created some amazing stuff with it once you rethink about all your tools so it's yeah. funny you say that because Joe just told a story about he um, I can't even remember he he went to see some big famous guy talk and he showed the beginning picture and it was just it yeah. was a picture that Joe said if I had taken that I would have thrown it you away. Thrown it away. Yeah. But Joe has a picture. Joe and I put together a um, and I'm talking about Joe Fitzpatrick. <laughs> Joe Fitzpatrick and I put together a composition class, which is part of the four oh, weeks to proficiency yeah. in photography. By the way, composition's so important. So well, there's important. a picture yeah. in there. And this was about, okay, so this one we were talking about color, okay? So Joe put a picture in there of these two birds on this, I don't know what it is, it's some kind of metal thing, off the, I think it's on the Fort Myers River, Caloosahatchee. But it was like, it was a gray day and it was, I guess it was getting dark and it, it just was, in my opinion, it was a terrible picture. And I'm thinking, I wouldn't have even taken that, but I would have yeah. thrown it away yeah. for sure. Yeah. All he did was change the color to make it look like it was sunset. Oh, yeah. And it yeah. was like, it was Amazing. a beautiful picture. It yeah. was like these two birds are roosting, you know, yeah. going down for the night. And yes. You, just, you yes. had all this feeling towards yes. this gray, ugly picture that he took before. Yes. Yes. He just changed the color. And, you know, you, you bring up such a good point. And this is where I think people struggle in this dichotomy of contest and magazine photo versus artistic photo and there's so many people out there that are like oh it's got to be you know the shot has to be in camera or no I don't use post-processing as if it's a badge of honor or you know some kind of criteria we all must uphold again it depends on the context that the image is for mm -hmm. so if I'm going to enter it in a contest none of my art stuff is going to go there um, because I will have changed something in most cases. Some things can be done out of camera, but it just depends on the situation. Um, but, and it may not fit all the contest rules. You know, we have all these wonderful camera clubs out there that adhere to certain rules for their contests each month, and they may not be a fit for that. Right. Keep that in that category, and then go over here and play. It's a different world, it's a different set of rules, and, and usually fewer rules. It's just a different place. So, you know, what you just said about, oh, you changed the color of the sky, there's the sky. There's going to be some people that'll be like, oh, well, no, that's, you yeah. know, horrible. And I'm thinking, for that situation, that may not be appropriate at all. For another situation, spot on. So it just depends. And just give yourself a little permission to play. It's yeah. really okay. Do you have any favorite, like, Photoshop filters or Lightroom tools or anything? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I use Photoshop quite a bit. Um, and if I'm in my Photoshop mind, my two favorite things are going to laugh. So simple. Uh, a, a extra layer, and I change it from normal to transparent and I paint with black or white at about five to 10% opacity and just bringing up or down certain subtle 
parts of the contrast, almost like dodging or burning, but it's not damaging to the pixels. So I, I play with that so much. That's all I do is a little Just bit a, of soft a, paint. a transparent layer. Transparent layer black and white paint and a soft brush. And I'll zoom in at the pixel level sometimes and just lightly pull up a highlight or just lightly pull down something. And there's other ways to do it, I'm sure. Right. But that's my personal Photoshop. I didn't even know that way. I've never simple, heard that. Simple, 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 simple. Because I always just go into the raw and pull up the yeah. highlights or something. and you can do that too. But it, I'm gonna try it your way too. This is very, <laughs> very specific. So, you know, re, like I, yeah. I'm a big person in, and contrast leads your eye through your image, and so I'm trying to give you a better path to see what I want you to see and diminish what I don't want you to pay attention to first. Okay. Um, and there, I think there's a YouTube video um, on my YouTube channel of some things on how to do that if okay. somebody wants to dig into it deeper. But my uh, kind of new favorite tool is to go into Luminar, which is a Photoshop alternative. Um, very inexpensive. It is not a monthly subscription, and I have a lot of my clients and customers who are, you know, hey, I want to do something, but I don't really want to get into the Photoshop world. What can I do? And Luminar has this tremendous volume of wonderful filters that you can play with and mix and match and, you know, do all kinds of custom things with. Um, and it still has a lot of the basic things that you would want out of a Photoshop tool or type tool, you know, being able to clone and layers and all that but it's really inexpensive and I've had a lot of fun with it. I just recently did a whole gallery where I used exclusively some custom built filters in there. Okay. Um, that's been a lot of fun and it's very inexpensive. So. Ah, Luminar, yeah. I'll, have yeah. to, I'll have to know that. Yeah. I'll have to look into that. And if so, you use my first name, if you buy it, you'll get a discount. So ooh, discounts yeah. are good. We'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, so yeah. hopefully we'll get some people to. Yeah, use Lisa <laughs> and I, you save some money. So Awesome. Yeah. But I love it, I love the tool, it's fun. So what's, the, what's your next adventure? Where are you going next? Ooh, well, um, let's see, I'm going back home because on Friday I have a, a gallery gallery opening and artist reception. Uh, nice. So they'll be back in Arizona and I have a whole gallery that's done in the vintage, well vintage classic and modern uh, wildlife, but so cool. primarily the vintage, a lot of fun. It's a really cool gallery and really cool um, pieces. That's at Boyce Thompson Arboretum. If anybody goes to Arizona, you have to go to Boyce Thompson Arboretum. It's about an hour outside of Phoenix an amazing location, amazing shooting, and really special place. Okay. Um, but anyway, so there's that. And then um, as soon as I'm done with that, um, I'm coming back to Florida actually very shortly because I will be doing the St. Augustine Birding and Photo Festival. Oh, yeah. I'll be their keynote speaker, and I'm teaching nine different sessions there. Awesome. Um, nine. Nine. <laughs> nine class. I love to teach a lot of things. Oh, my I am gosh, not a one so, note. <laughs> you're going to be exhausted. I'll be busy. I'll be busy. But, um, but I have that. And then. And uh, when is that? That is in April, mid April. Um, you the don't dates know the off date. the top of my okay. head. I can get them for you, but yeah. Uh, well, we'll put them in the show notes. Okay, yeah. I think the third weekend in April, like the 15th through the 22nd, or somewhere, whatever those dates are. Um, and then uh, I, I one day home, and then I'm doing my hummingbird workshop. So I do a, a in southern Arizona, we're known for our hummingbirds. Ah. So I have uh, myself and my co leader, Kim Gray, she's a wonderful photographer as well. We do hummingbirds and we're the only tour that I know with hummingbirds where everybody gets their own station the entire time. Oh, There's wow. plenty of birds to go around and most workshops will have you share a station. So if you're there for three days, you're really only shooting for a day and a half because you're taking All turns. Right. Um, we give everybody their own and it, it's, it is so much fun. It is one of my I've joys. never, that looks tough to me. Have to, I, have to, I have to go. We do all the work for go, you. We I can't it do it up. yet. <laughs> <laughs> we show Next you how year. to do it. We set it up for you. We teach you how, uh, but it's a really, for the people, it's a really relaxed day. You sit there in a chair, you know, with a beverage of choice and you sit with your remote trigger and photograph these amazing hummingbirds and we have all the flash setups and all everything and I've looked into the ethics behind it for the birds and during daytime and it, it does not appear to be an issue. I'm a big follower of ethics. I'm a board of directors member for the National, uh, excuse me, the North American Nature Photographers Association and ethics are important to me and so I do I like uh, the drinking part. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It, 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 is, it is an absolute gas and then on the heels of that um, I have a few more birding festivals that I'm doing, and then um, I have some stuff in Yellowstone and the Tetons I'm doing, and then I'll be in Alaska for almost a month leading my tours there, so wow. it doesn't stop. <laughs> you go, girl. <laughs> my stop. goodness. Yeah, it's a busy You're year. You're one of those so. overachievers for sure. <sighs> Holy moly. But you still got to find time to be creative and have fun, you know? That's so. hard. And it's hard, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It is But hard. it gives you a lot more, when you think this way, 
it gives you a lot more rewarding time. If you only have so many hours to shoot in a day, you can come up with so many more things to be proud of and happy and get fulfilled from. At the end of the day, this photography stuff should be fun and it'll make it more fun for you, in my opinion. That is so, awesome. And what's yeah. your website? My website is langellphotography.com. So L-A-N-G-E-L-L photography. All right. We'll put all of that stuff in the yes. show notes so Thank people you. can find you easily. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. But Lisa Langell. I welcome. All right. Remember, show notes, understandphotography.com. And I forgot about my announcement because can't forget that our book <laughs> Joe Fitzpatrick and I put together a guidebook on Florida photo spots Naples and Collier County so if you are coming to this area or you're in this area it's a guidebook for all kinds of photographers portrait photographers as well as nature photographers where we give you the coordinates where to go what to do um, what's the best time of day to go there what are you gonna see what are you gonna shoot that kind of stuff it's available on Amazon and of course I'll have the link in our show notes. Florida Photo Spots by Joe Fitzpatrick and Peggy Farron. <laughs> this is Peggy Farron. Thank you so much for watching the Understand Photography Show. We will see you next Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you for watching the Understand Photography Show. It would help us immensely if you would click like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.